five unsolved murder mysteries that are very creepy. Murders happen all around the world. Some are solved within days or weeks, and sometimes it can take years. Unfortunately, though, in some instances, the killer has been known to get away with the crime. Such are the cases on this list. These are five unsolved murder mysteries that are very creepy. Number five, Jodine Serin. It was Valentine's Day 2007. Jodine Serin was 39 years old and despite being mentally disabled, she was high functioning and lived in her own apartment in Carlsbad, San Diego. To make sure she was okay though, her parents made a visit to her every day. That evening, Jodine's parents checked in on their daughter like usual. They knocked on the door, the lights were on, but no one answered. After several tries and calls, Jodine's father, Art, broke down the door. Once inside, they walked through her dark bedroom and were shocked to find their daughter having sex with an unknown man. Upset but thinking they walked in on an awkward situation, Art told the man to get dressed and leave while both parents waited in the adjoining room. The man did as he was told and left. Minutes passed and the parents waited, but Jodine never came out of her room. After asking for her to come out several times without a response, they decided to go in. There, they were treated to an even more shocking sight than what they had just seen. Jodine was lying in the nude, dead. She had been beaten and strangled to death. It was later clear that while her parents were waiting for this man to get dressed and leave, he was also killing their daughter at the very same time. The man left without Jodine's parents knowing anything. With the amount of bruises she suffered, it was clear the sex between the two was not consensual and her parents had witnessed her being raped in front of them without even realizing it. Police studied the crime scene and collected DNA evidence, and although they tried to find a suspect, the case went cold. For 11 years, no one knew who raped or killed the woman. Over the years, as advances in technology arrived, investigators would run the suspect's DNA through various databases, but it was always a dead end. But then recently, they turned to phenotyping and forensic genealogy, hoping it would solve the mystery. Phenotyping recreates what the suspect may have looked like based on the DNA. Forensic genealogy, meanwhile, uses existing DNA from family trees freely submitted online to find familial matches. This was the same procedure used to capture the Golden State Killer. When investigators used this technique on Jodine's case, one possible name came up, David Mabrito. Mabrito was a former Oceanside resident and was 38 years old at the time of the crime. Once his name came up, it was a matter of obtaining his direct DNA from another law enforcement agency, but as it turns out, his DNA was never entered into a system because he had passed away in 2011. Even though police say they are sure that he raped and killed Saren, they still don't have answers on motive or whether Saren even knew the suspect at all. Number 4. Terry Bevers On April 18, 2016, Terry Bevers, also known as Missy, arrived at Creekside Church in Midlothian, Texas at 4 a.m. for an early morning fitness class she was leading. But minutes before her, church surveillance captured a figure dressed in what appeared to be full SWAT gear. This individual carried a hammer and what looked to be a small crowbar. Although it wasn't captured on camera, the intruder and Missy did encounter each other that morning. When one of Missy's students arrived at the church for class, police received a frantic 911 call stating that there was an unresponsive woman inside. Missy didn't survive the attack and it was later revealed she had suffered multiple stab wounds to her head and chest. Three years after the murder, the case still remains unsolved. Even though there was clear surveillance footage, police still have no suspects or concrete leads. During the initial phase of the investigation, scrutiny focused on Missy's husband, Brand, but it turns out he was 600 miles out of town on a fishing trip during the killing. People then believe the murder may have been a robbery gone wrong and that Missy was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the idea of robbery seemed off as the intruder looked half-hearted in trying to pry open the doors or even steal anything from the church at all. The intruder also left Missy's diamond wedding ring on her finger. If robbery was the motive, 
then most likely that would be the first thing they took. Investigators estimate the intruder to be around 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 7. From the video, they couldn't distinguish whether the person was male or female. It's also noted the killer had a very distinctive walking gait. Although the investigation still doesn't have any solid evidence of who the killer might be, internet sleuths are pointing to one potential suspect, Brandon Bever's father and Missy's father-in-law, Randy. According to them, Randy seems a likely suspect since days after Missy was murdered, he brought in a bloodstained shirt to the cleaners. Randy said it was from a dog injury, which supposedly the vet confirmed. But footage of Randy walking, though, seems to match up with the height and weight of the intruder. Even more telling was that the distinctive gait also mirrored Randy's. After Missy's death, investigations revealed the couple had been having marital as well as financial difficulties. There were also allegations Missy was having an affair, and so it's believed Randy may have helped his son out of the relationship. But Randy seems to have a solid alibi and said he was out traveling in California at the time of the murder. Even though until now there's no resolution to the case, the Bevers are still hopeful that one day they will find an answer as to who killed Missy. Number 3. Nicole Smith On June 7, 1995, it was the start of a normal day for 14-year-old Nicole Smith from Southwest Atlanta. She was walking from her Deerfield apartment complex with her sister and a friend. Midway though, Nicole realized she had forgotten to bring her book report. She told her sister and friend to go on without her and that she was going to head back home to get it. She decided to take a shortcut through the woods, hoping to cut time. But as she walked, she was attacked by a man who assaulted her and shot her twice in the head. Security guards in the area heard the gunshots and rushed towards them. They found Nicole's body and her school bag, which had her identification, but there was no sign of the killer. Years later, in June of 2004, another girl was viciously attacked the same way, three miles away at East Point. The 13-year-old was dragged into the woods, then raped. However, this time, the team was able to run away and inform police. She described the assailant as a black man, about 20 to 30 years old, and approximately 5 feet 10 inches tall. He had a medium complexion with a gap in his front teeth, and he was wearing gold-framed glasses during the attack. The DNA collected was later matched to the same man that attacked and killed Nicole Smith. Despite this link, though, the case remained unsolved, and even now, there's still no suspects. Anyone with information can submit anonymously to the Crime Stoppers Atlanta tip line at 404-577-TIPS. It's also possible to contact them via crimestoppersatlanta.org. Number 2. Candace Hiltz Considered a child prodigy, Candace Hiltz was already doing calculus by the time she was 11. She lived with her mother in Cannon City, Colorado, but while still a teen, Candace found herself pregnant and she gave birth to a daughter named Paige. One day, Fremont County Sheriff's Deputy Robert Dodd arrived at the Hiltz home looking for James, Candace's older brother. James suffered from such severe paranoia that he lived in the wooded area at the back of the family's home. The officer said he wanted to question James about a trespassing incident. Both Candace and her mother were present during the questioning, and at some point, Candace didn't like the officer's tone and let him know about it. In the end, a shouting match ensued between the two. When the officer threatened the teen he would arrest her, she put up her wrists and dared him to. Then Candace said she had seen the officer accepting envelopes from known drug dealers in town and would gladly let his superiors know about it. Days after this incident, the family came home and realized their dog was missing. They thought it was odd but figured the animal had wandered off or may have been attacked by a mountain lion since they lived in the forest. Candace went to the sheriff's office to report her dog missing but got into another altercation while there. It's unsure whether she got into a fight with Officer Dodd or if it was others. Then on August 15, 2006, Candace's mother, Dolores, left home to run errands. While out, she realized something was off and called the neighbors to have them check on Candace, but they never did. 
Then when Dolores got home around 3.30 p.m., she went inside the house to find her granddaughter Paige crying and screaming inside her crib. She then found pools and spatters of blood, but still there were no signs of Candace. She ran to the room to pick up Paige, but discovered something stuffed underneath the bed. It was wrapped inside a green comforter. Dolores opened it and felt sick to her stomach when she found her daughter dead. The girl had so many gunshot wounds to her face that it nearly decapitated her. Dolores then called 911. The two officers tasked to lead the investigation was Deputy Drisco and Deputy Dodd, the same officer Candace had an altercation with. According to the family, the investigation was shoddy at best. Despite being veteran officers, the two left behind a lot of evidence uncollected at the crime scene. The area wasn't taped off properly, and people walked in and out, contaminating the crime scene. Worse still is that almost immediately, the officers pointed to James, Candace's mentally ill brother, as the main suspect. They organized a manhunt, searching the wooded area behind the home, stating they were looking for evidence, but the family believes it was a ruse to find James. It was during this search the family dog was found. He had been tied to a tree and then butchered with an axe. People believe the dog was taken to stop him from alerting anyone if an intruder went inside the home. Others say it was to taunt the family. Candace's murder became a cold case. Officers still pointed to James as a possible suspect even though he denied it and had no history of violence whatsoever or even owned a gun. What's more is that it was clear from the investigation that Candace was shot by three different people and suffered gunshot wounds from several different guns. Fast forward to 2017 when Rick Ratzliff bought a storage unit for $50. Inside he found police lights, police uniforms, and case files. Then he discovered a box marked evidence and he knew he had found something that wasn't supposed to be there. When he inquired who had owned the unit prior to his purchase, it was none other than Deputy Officer Robert Dodd. Rick told police about what he found and his wife recorded the interaction. The conversation between the officers was threatening and in fact, they forced him to keep his mouth shut about finding the evidence inside the locker. Dodd's family also tried to buy back that locker from him. Inside the evidence box, they found the axe used to kill Candace's dog as well as the blood-stained rope. There was also bloody socks and a backpack containing Candace's bloody shirt. Then at a landfill outside of Cannon City, more evidence was found from a sexual assault case Dodd was involved in. The officer had thrown that out as well. Eventually, the word got out about the locker finding. The evidence was taken and held by the Colorado Bureau of Investigations. They have pledged to look into the misconducts with the Fremont County Sheriff's Department. Dodd eventually faced trial in 2018 for abusing public records and two counts of second-degree official misconduct. When asked why he had kept the evidence, he simply said, no comment. Many believe Dodd, as well as other officers, might have been involved with the case or at least botched it from the get-go, although there's no concrete proof tying them to the murder. Despite Dodd and the police's handling of the evidence, no one has been arrested in Candace Hiltz's death. Number 1. Seawind Murder Mysteries It was Pentecost weekend of 1976, but in a little house in Seawind, Switzerland, five people were brutally shot to death. Using a Winchester rifle, 13 rounds were fired off. 11 of those shots were used to shoot the victims in the head, the last two were fired into their bodies. The victims killed were 62-year-old Elsa Segris Sackinger, her 63-year-old husband Eugene, Eugene's sister Anna, who was 80, and her two sons, 52-year-old Emmanuel and Max Westhauser, who was 49. It's believed the killer had only intended to kill both Elsa and Eugene, but was shocked to find other people there, so he decided to kill them as well. The crime was discovered on June 6, 1976 by a female passerby. Police arrived to find four of the corpses inside the house. The fifth one was found wrapped in a carpet and placed on the terrace. Despite heavy questioning and investigations, police found only two possible suspects. The first was a man named Carl Dozer. In the fall of 1996, a Winchester rifle was discovered inside the kitchen hall of a house owned by a woman with the last name Doser. It was discovered the gun belonged to Carl 
and was an imitation of an Italian Winchester with a short barrel. This was the same weapon used to kill all the victims. Carl was interviewed by police about it, but he said he bought the gun at a flea market. Even though police were suspicious of him, they could not find any motive and no evidence linking him to the victims. Then there was Adolf Johnny Segrist, a relative of the victims. A business acquaintance of Adolf, Hans Blaser, said that Adolf had something to do with the murder. Because three weeks before the incident, Blazer said Adolf had asked him for ammunition. He said he needed extra heavy lead bullets and asked if it would fit in his Italian Winchester rifle. He also said he was getting it as a gift for someone else. When police searched his apartment, there were styrofoam heads that had been shot through in his flat. Adolf was also described as being a man who was insecure about his height and his voice because he sounded like a woman. It's believed he may have worked with Dozer to get revenge on Eugene for belittling him. Although he was arrested temporarily, he was let go and died during the mid-1980s. The Seawind murders continue to remain a mystery, although there are strong suspects in both Dozer and Adolf, no direct evidence has linked them to the crime. So there were five unsolved murder mysteries that are very creepy. Some murders are straightforward, while others are extremely baffling. The five cases you just heard are some of the few that still rattle questions even after years of investigations. Many still hope these cases will eventually be solved, although it's unlikely the more that time goes by. If you enjoyed this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday that we know you want to check out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.